The last time we were together, I was talking about uh, issues of kinematics, and I defined my basic kinematic quantities. So I'm just going to reiterate that by defining them here again. I know that I can define the positions of objects or events in my universe according to some coordinate system, and I call that position x. But from that, I define the displacement delta x, because mine, of course, is a physics of change, because my universe is a universe of change. And so the displacement is a quantity, which um, in our next meeting, I'm going to be describing as a vector quantity. Today, I'm not so concerned about its vectorness. What I'm concerned about today is the way that it represents change of the locations of objects or events in my universe. So delta x is the change, which is always final minus initial. Your, all of your sciences and engineering are very reliable that way. You encounter change quantities in lots of different contexts, all over the place. And they're always final minus initial. The final value minus the initial value is how we define change. Well, once I define the displacement, the very next thing that I define is the velocity on average. That the velocity is equal to the change in the position with respect to time. That is the displacement divided by time. And so I can read that. I'm a big fan of reading equations, about being able to look at an equation and describe its meaning from one end to the other. A person who looks at equations as a place to stick numbers in the hopes of getting a right answer is not doing physics. They may be doing school, but they're not doing physics at all when you do that. You have to be able to look at an equation and read it from end to end. And it's, it's a, mathematics is kind of a language. I know that's like a sort of a romantic and not necessarily a useful thing to do. But mathematics is a language to read the equation. And what I read when I see this is that the velocity is defined as the rate at which displacement happens. But a curious, important thing about this quantity that I pointed out, it's very deep and subtle, but I only talked about it for a few moments. And that is that I have an initial position and a final position. And if I'm being truly honest, I do not know any other information about the state of the system. I know its initial and final configuration, and I don't know what happened in between. What happened in between could have simply been a straight line motion from one point to the other in space at constant speed. That's certainly a way it could be, but it's not the only way. In fact, there's an infinite number of ways that it could unfold, going back and forth and jiggling around, or it could do something truly bizarre outside of my understanding of everyday nature or outside of my experience. So this velocity quantity is only defined on average. And so it has its limitations being described as an average quantity. And it wouldn't be surprising if I said, well, you know, I'd really rather know the instantaneous value. I would like to know what is the value of the velocity at every single instant in time. You give me a time, I give you a velocity associated with that time. Now, I pointed out as a little bit of fun in the last discussion that that's a little bit of a fallacy, that it's sort of a fantastical thing. The reality of our universe is that the velocity at every instant in time is actually a physically unknowable thing. There are limitations in our universe that prevent us from knowing that. But in our classical physics that we're doing here, in principle, it's possible to know. And it'll turn out that when you learn it, and I have that equation in principle that's v as a function of t, you give me a t, I give you a velocity, that for all practical purposes, I can apply that to describe phenomenon in everyday life, sort of, on average. Right? I'll find there's uncertainty associated with it. I'll find that there are areas in my experimentation of my science where it fails. But in principle, it's good enough as sort of an approximate view of things, the velocity defined on average. And then I immediately go on to define the acceleration on average, where the acceleration is the change in velocity with respect to time, with a quick tip of the cap to the fact that I can keep on doing this forever and ever. But it turns out this is as far as I really need to go to devise a practical physics, the acceleration defined on average. Now, yesterday, or well, yesterday, but last discussion, I talked about how it was possible to get a better value. And it's a really simple and obvious thing that instead of turning my back on the universe for a long time, that is, I measure a position, stop looking and wait around for a bit and then look back and then find the new position. Instead of turning your back on the universe for a long time, perhaps you do it for a shorter time. If you do it for a shorter time, then you eliminate from the situation opportunity for the change to behave strangely. Right? Strange behavior takes a little bit of time. If I look very, very closely on short intervals of time, it turns out the behavior might be, might be. It's not the reality. It's not the way the universe necessarily works. 
But it might be, I might even go so far as to say, it's likely to be that the thing behaves very, is very well behaved on very, very short time intervals. So the idea there is that if I look really closely, I get a better value, still in principle defined on average, but replacing delta x, a change in position, with dx. All I've done is change the notation. I'm driving this home. It's a really important idea of notation to grasp, to understand what's going on here. I have simply replaced the very obvious, it's over there, now it's over here, with a displacement that is infinitesimally small, or very extraordinarily small. I don't want to say infinitesimal yet, it is deep. It's very, very small. Very, very small. And the reason why that happened is that I make the time interval very small. If I observe over a very short time scale, then the displacement is very small indeed. So these expressions are exactly the same. Important to appreciate that. They're exactly the same, but the notation is warning me that in one case, the intervals are quite small. And so I can write the same thing over here for the um, acceleration, uh, which is delta V over delta T. I'll simply write it as dV over dt. dV over dt. So what I said was, my definitions of velocity and acceleration give me the quantity on average, but I don't want the average quantity. It's not good enough. I want the instantaneous quantity. So the very next question is, how do I obtain the instantaneous quantity? How do I obtain the instantaneous quantity? Because I can't just final minus initial and do the ratio because that's not good enough. It's not going to get me the thing on average. It's only going to get me the thing on average. It's not going to get me what I want. So what I'm going to do is do a demonstration, whereas if you've been a diligent student, you've seen me do this, de this, this demonstration before. You've seen me do this demonstration before. I'm going to do it again because it's really important that we understand the way that it goes and how I'm going to proceed here. I want to imagine that I know the position of a thing as a function of time, sort of my ansatz for the thing, that I'm going to know the position as a function of time. That is, I have an equation where you give me a time and I can tell you exactly what the position is. Well, that right there is a little bit of an absurd notion. How do I know the position at every instant in time? It's an important question. And it, previously I would have said, and it's not hard to find examples out there on the internet ether, of me saying out loud that there's no such thing as trajectories. They don't actually exist. But in our physics, as an approximate idea, they do. So I want to write an expression that is a position as a function of time. It's a position as a function of time. Right? So I'm going to write that. Uh, x is a function of time. And now I'm going to make it up. So I'm just going to choose right now some position as a function of time. I don't know what it's going to be. What it's going to be? Why don't I make it 2x squared minus 3? I'm trying to choose an example that's not going to be too hard on me in terms of the algebra. I can choose any result and do this demonstration. It would work, but I could be asking for serious trouble. Yeah? It's a function of time. Why wouldn't it be t's? You're absolutely right, right off the bat. It's a function of very little sleep is what it is, but it's also a function of t. So let me, pardon me, let me rewrite it. It's 2t squared. What did I say? Minus 3? Is that what I wrote? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 2t squared minus 3. That's what I made up. I would like to compute from that dx over dt. It's dx over dt that I would like to compute. Well, how, how do you even do that? Like, what's the procedure for finding dx dt? What is the procedure for finding dx dt when you already know x is a function of time? There's a procedure. What would it be? Well, this is a thing. I'll take a moment here just to express an idea of our physics that we're going to do together, but also everything technical that you're going to do after this. This is the most subtle thing that I try to teach students. It is the hardest thing to become good at. It's the most challenging thing. When you are faced by a thing that you do not understand or do not know and do not know how to proceed, the solution is almost always to write down things that you are certain are true. Right? Because the, a, a very vexing thing that will happen to you, particularly as young students, is you'll be confronted by a problem, and I hear it all the time, and you know that I do. I have no idea. I don't even know where to start. All right? That's a problem. We need to transcend that. What we need to do is look at a thing and go, I have no idea, which happens to me, by the way. At some point this year, you'll come to me and you'll say, Charlie, have a look at this one. Uh, what, the, what the heck is going on here? And I'll look at it and go, man, that's weird. Now, 
I'm going to solve it. Of course I am. And when I do, you might look at that and say, boy, Shidley just knows how to solve all of the problems. He just knows how to solve the problems. That's not true. I don't know the solution to that thing, but I know the way to proceed. The way to proceed is to just begin to write down things that are true and see what happens. So as I do this thing that I'm about to do, you might look at it and go, well, how did you know to do that? Well, you, you might not ask yourself that, but you're like, well, Shiley's the teacher. He knows exactly what he's doing because he sat down at home at night last night and worked this problem out. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. I don't have time for that. Football's on. <laughs> I got a nap and then watch football. So I'm just going to proceed. Of course, I'm proceeding from a position of a little bit of wisdom and experience, OK? Yes, of course, it's easier for me than it is for you. But here I go, writing down a thing that's true. The very first thing that I'm going to do for you is I'm going to, if, if I look at this, this is my philosophy going into it. I want to know what V is. In order to know what V is, I'm going to have to compute what dx divided by dt is. So a, a, a way that I look at problem solving when I'm doing my physics is this. The question is, what is, what is the velocity as a function of time? That's, why, that's ultimately the question that I'm asking. What is the velocity as a function of time? Well, that question becomes, as soon as I look at it, since the velocity is dx over dt, now the question becomes, what's dx? Because I cannot calculate the velocity until I find dx. So very often when I'm problem solving, I'm chasing the problem along. The initial question becomes another question that becomes another question that becomes another question that I can answer. And then when I answer that one, it answers the previous one, it answers the previous one, it answers the previous one, and now I have a very sophisticated solution to a problem that superficially seems very complicated. So I want to calculate what is dx. What is dx? That's my first task to calculate what is dx. Well, dx, I now understand, because I learned and I listened very carefully when Shidley was saying, that dx is the same as delta x. It really is the final value of x minus the initial value of x. Even though the notation's different, it's still final minus initial. It's still final minus initial. So if I want to compute what dx is, I'll write final minus initial. So I'm going to write uh, x final minus x initial. Ugh. I don't usually use subscripts f and i. I just did it spontaneously there, and I grossed myself out. You know I like to use x minus x naught. But I, was, I wanted to put final minus initial just to really drive home that idea that I'm calculating a change quantity. So now the question has changed again. The initial question was, what is the velocity? And then it became, well, what is dx? And then it becomes, what it, after it's what is dx, is what is x initial? What is x initial? Well, x initial is whatever x is equal to at some time t. So x initial is 2t squared minus 3. That's what x initial is. It's the value of x at some time t. <laughs> a lot of times, students, they don't want to do physics in the context of all symbols. I don't want numbers. Don't give me numbers. I don't want <laughs> Santa, can you plug numbers in? I was make it into a number. No, 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 no. It's all, all algebraic. Get used to it. Very often, you'll be asked questions where the answer is an algebraic answer. And that's the kind of problem that we love. We don't want to use numbers in the thing. So the initial x is just 2 t But then what would the final x be? So the question, what is the velocity, has become what is dx, has become what is the final value of x? Well, the final value of, of x, right here that dx is equal to, the final value of x is x not at t, not at t, but at t plus a little bit, right? If t is where you start, then the final is at t plus a little bit. What little bit? dt. dt is the little bit that I add. So I'm going to write down x final, and I'm going to write it as 2, the quantity t plus dt squared. You see what I did there? I just went to where that t is, and I plugged in the initial time, which I'm just calling t, plus the final time, or plus the, the change in the time, which is dt, because dt is a little bit of a step in time. So the time in the future, the time final, is going to be t plus dt. t plus dt. So that's the final value of the position minus the initial value. 
Well, the initial value is just 2t squared minus 3. I have to be careful here because I have that minus sign in between. I want to be careful with my algebra because I got that minus 3 there, and I have to be careful what that minus sign is going to do to the minus 3. Oh, I left off. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Pardon me. I left off. Uh, I was in the middle of talking. This is, what, this is what folks are complaining about. I left off. When I plugged in that t is t plus dt, I left off the minus 3 here. Pardon me. And from that, I'm going to subtract 2t squared uh, minus 3. So there you go. That's a clear thing that happens here. You've got to keep me honest because I'm talking and doing algebra at the same time. I may make mistakes, and you may look at it and go, no, I must be wrong. No, it's, it's entirely possible that I'm wrong. Try talking and doing physics. It's like that patting your stomach and rubbing your head at the same time kind of nonsense. It's tricky to do. Talking and thinking and writing simultaneously and drinking. Water. I don't know if you heard or not, but yesterday I was going gung-ho in honors physics, and I was here, and I was like, blah, 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 measurement and uncertainty, and I picked up the water and took a big chug, and it was somebody else's water. <laughs> <laughs> That'll break your concentration. <laughs> That'll break your concentration. Yeah. So, there it is. You want a DX. There it is. Maybe I can simplify it a bit. Oh, they ran me down a rail in my earlier math classes. Simplify, 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 simplify. Well, let's see what I can do with this a little bit. Now, I've got a lot of brackets and nonsense going on, a lot of notation going on here. It's 2 times t plus dt squared. So I'm going to foil that. I'm going to foil that out, Get all the, to barf up all the terms that are inside of it. So first outside, inside, last, t squared, please, and keep an eye on me. I'm a little bit woozy, so I might be making mistakes here. Um, plus 2t dt. Every once in a while, I may change the order of terms. I wouldn't ever want to write this as dtt. That is disorienting, right? Because dt is kind of its own thing. I would never want to write it as, t, as dtt, right? Uh, plus the last term is going to be dt squared, right? Like that, right? All of those get multiplied by 2. Of course, that's minus 3. I'm not going to forget my friend minus 3 this time. And then it's going to uh, have this term that I do nothing to because there's nothing I can, I can't simplify that in any way or make that somehow more useful. Well, I see a lot of things going on here. There may be lots of common terms that are available to me. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to multiply through and I'm going to get rid of all of my brackets as I go along. This is 2t squared plus 2t dt plus dt squared minus 3 minus 2t squared. That minus makes that plus 3 right there. There we go. Oh my gosh, Shiley, it's the ugliest thing ever. Well, it's not. Hello? Um, yeah, I heard that friends couldn't um, multiply 2 with t squared. And I didn't multiply the dt by the 2, right? And you also didn't multiply the dt by the 2. Jeez! Well, terribly irresponsible. So you, you multiply all of that out, uh, 2t squared. So I imagined, just while I'm busy rewriting my mistakes here, so I imagined that this would be fun, that I had done a formal version of the thing, and now I would do a casual version of the thing, and now I immediately regret that decision because I'm not going to edit all of these mistakes out. Perhaps that'll be inspirational to students, be like, wow, Shadi makes mistakes too. <laughs> it's much easier to grab it with the mouse and select it and delete, and then it never happened. Uh, we'll go ahead and leave that. So, uh, it looks terrible. Well, it's not nearly as terrible as it seems, is it? Because if I look closely, I've got a couple lovely things happening here. I've got a 2t squared here. And then further along, I have a negative 2t squared. So I'll cancel those 2t squareds out because it subtracts away. Also, immediately I see, same deal, with the negative 3 here. I have a minus 3, and then I have a plus 3. So they go away. So what I've calculated is actually much more compact this is dx. This is the thing that I wanted. dx is much more compact than I thought, that I had originally thought. And I'm going to go ahead and write it out. I'm going to change the order of the terms. Am I going to change the order of the terms? Nah, I'm not going to change the order of the terms. I'll leave it just the way that it is. 4t dt plus 2 dt squared. Now, as a student, I get kind of upset 
I get kind of upset because I mean, yeah, I don't know. What, is it, what does it mean? What does it mean? I don't get it. It's important to remain calm in the middle of derivations, particularly in our physics where things get sophisticated. It's important to remain calm and just honestly say, well, that's what it is. If I had been alone doing this and hadn't had Brendan helping me out with it, I'd probably be wrong at this point. <laughs> well, that's OK. You live and you learn. But now I've gotten to this point. If I'm confident that I'm doing algebra correctly, if I have self-confidence in that, I get to this point. I get that weird looking thing. What the heck is that? Well, I don't know, but that's what it is, right? You have to be honest with yourself and say, well, I don't know what's going on, but that's what it is. So the question, what is the velocity, became what is the question dx, which has now found an answer. The velocity, of course, I know, according to my definition, is dx divided by dt. So I have dx. All I have to do is take dx and divide it by dt. So I take my 4, uh, t dt, uh, plus 2 dt squared, and I divide that by dt, which is really nice. Because the dt in the first term, the 4 t dt, that dt is going to go away completely, which is quite nice. In the second term, perhaps I'm not so lucky that it's dt squared divided by dt, which just becomes dt. So my result here becomes that the velocity is equal to, or may in fact be equal to, I don't know, I'm going to have to do some thinking, maybe equal to 4t plus 2 dt. Charlie, you said you wanted the velocity as a function of time. Now you have the velocity as a function of time and dt. But that's OK, isn't it? Because I've made an argument that my interval is going to be really, really small. That dt is very, very small. How small? Infinitesimally small. Infinitesimally. Shall is not small enough? Divide by a billion. Arbitrarily small. Arbitrarily small. So small that that extraordinarily small number times 2 is so bizarrely small. Arbitrarily small. Shall is not small enough? You're not getting me. It can be as smart, small as I care to make it. Make it so small that it doesn't matter anymore, and I've now found the velocity. The velocity is equal to 4t. So I've now learned the procedure by which I can get a polynomial position as a function of time and derive from it the velocity as a function of time. And it is exactly what I wanted. It's the velocity as a function of time. I give you a time. You, you give me a time. I give you a velocity exactly as advertised. Oh my gosh, Charlie, am I going to do this every time? Am I going to do this every time? Oh my god. Oh my gosh. And what if it was t to the sixth and whatnot and other stuff was going on? I'd be, ah, it'd become enormous. We'd need long paper, perhaps toilet paper, roll it out to work out all the terms. But we find if we do this over and over and over and over and over again, we find that there are general patterns to the behavior here. That there are general patterns to the behavior. Notice what's happened. I'm going to put these side by side here, but I'm going to write them in a funny way. I'm going to write them in a funny way. Well, I'm not going to write them in a funny way. <laughs> I'm just going to compare them side by side. Oops. The position is a function of time that I originally gave here, gives way to v is equal to 4 times t. If we did this over and over again, now there's a little bit of trust here, and you trust that I know what I'm talking about. If we did this over and over again, if we did this over and over again, this procedure, we would discover a bit of a pattern. Look what happened here. There is a t that is squared here. And then the first term that appears in the answer, the t, but the t is not squared. The exponent has been demoted. The t is not squared anymore. The exponent has been knocked down. I like this procedure. If that happens all the time, that exponents get knocked down, I'm going to like taking derivatives because it simplifies things. Now, Charlie, that's just a, that's just a coincidence, is it? Boo? This 3 that I originally wrote here is 3 t to the 0. Oh, Charlie, don't be silly. Don't be silly. t to the 0 is 1. 
t to the 0 is 1. Right? You never write that because it's 1. But it really is t to the 0. It really is t to the 0. So look what's happening here. In front, this 2 became a 4. So what happened as this term went to this equation is that the 2 came down and multiplied, became a 4, and the exponent was demoted to minus 1 is t. Right? Now, when you learn this in calculus class, you learn it in the context of limits and some fancy stuff. It's an argument that I make very often. An argument that I make very often is mathematics is deliberately complicated by notation. Here's how I say it happens. The monomial has an exponent. The exponent comes down. Whoa, 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 whoa. There's a sound effect for it. And multiplies. And then the exponent gets demoted. So how do I perform this operation? That's how I find the rate of change of this polynomial function. So here's the very important point that I'm making. This procedure that I've done here, respecting the fact that I understand this definition of the velocity, the rate of change of position, or the rate at which a displacement happens, however you like to say that, it's equivalent, that this rate of change of position is computing by appreciating the fact that it's a ratio of a two change quantities. And then I follow that argument through, and a thing happens. It's quite complicated. But then I observe that there are patterns. And all I need do is to learn the patterns. And once I learn the patterns, things start happening very quickly. As a matter of fact, there are those among us who looked at what I wrote initially on, on the board and immediately knew what answer I was going to get. Because the pattern, it turns out, is quite simple to do. There are complex versions of it. There are more complicated examples. I'm going to do one or two just to be like, things can get squirrely. But it's very simple and straightforward, this pattern. The patterns get written down. And for our purposes, for our course, you have been, has been distributed to you this lovely packet of equations that are relevant to our physics and ultimately relevant to our physics exam. And in it, among with all these physics equations and various, thing, various uh, uh, constants and so forth and identities and things, uh, is a list there, if you don't mind looking at it, called calculus. What this is is a list of the patterns that have been observed. Now, you can take a course in calculus and have chapter after chapter of excruciating proofs as to why these patterns should be so. But let's you and I agree that the patterns exist. This list of patterns that is given here to you is exceptional. Believe it or not, this list of patterns here is almost, but not quite, almost, but not quite, everything you need to know in order to be a professional who uses calculus to solve problems. Right here on this list. It's not exhaustive. It, yes, Hallie, what about <laughs> someone, someone experienced the calculus is here. Hallie, what about L'Hopital's rule? <laughs> I've never used L'Hopital's rule, ever, for anything. But Shadi, why are they so excited about it? Because they dig math. They're all about the math, right? I'm not going to, I'm not going to like harp on math too much, but you spend a lot of time early in your calculus training working on functions that go like this and they, oh, and they don't meet. One's got an open circle and the other one's got a dot. What the hell is that? Is that ever going to be a natural thing? Imagine that that was position as a function of time. It's really awesome. It's a sci-fi function. The position's going along just great, and then all of a sudden, whoa, whoa what? Oh, oh my word. Whoo, whoo, whoo. The position of a thing can't change instantaneously, so how useful is that? How useful is that to me, the scientist? The answer is not at all. Good luck with the 50 problems you have in your math homework related to graphs that look just like that. All right. Now, it's not, that, it's not that there aren't peculiarities in math as it applies to physical sciences. There are peculiarities, and some fun stuff will happen, and some will bend and break the rules and whatnot. But by and large, the application of mathematics to physical sci sciences is limited to a set of mathematical principles that are actually, for clever people, that are actually easy to handle. The second one on the list. Which how are you skipping the first one on the list? I know, I'm going to come back to that one. The second one on the list is that 
some fancy notation. I guess I'll rewrite it here on the board just so I can, so I can put this paper down and talk about it. The first one that appears on the list here is D over DX of <laughs> X to the N. I don't know why I'm looking at the paper. It reminds me kind of a funny story. Um, N to the X or, or N, X to the N minus 1. And I'm looking off the paper. Uh, there was a time, I'm a little bit known for being rather good at talking about physics in front of groups of people. And a professor came to me one time and said, I want you to come and watch me teach and so I can figure out why I'm so terrible at it. So I said, well, I don't know what the hell I do that's so good. I just go in and wing it. Uh, so I went to see uh, his lecture, and I went into the back and sat down with all the students, and he immediately started lecturing, and I instantly knew what the problem was. Instantly knew what the problem was, and I got up and walked out. And I saw him later for lunch, and he's like, what happened? You just walked out. I'm like, yeah, because I know what your problem is. He was lecturing like this. And so um, the, the thing is, the, so this problem, and it works like this, and uh, re like with the paper in his hand. And I said, I, for my first question was, do you not know what you're talking about? They go, no, I know, of course I know what I'm talking about. Then put your paper down and talk about it, right? People preparing for a presentation. Oh, I've got these notes. I've got to be, got to be clear on what I'm going to say and what I'm going to say and what I'm going to say. Don't. Know what the hell you're talking about and then talk about it. Right, Felix? Yep. I'm just saying because <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't always work. It's, it's incredible the way that came together, isn't it? Yeah, just get right up there and start talking. <laughs> and if you, know, if you know what you're talking about, everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be great. So I know what this rule is. Oh, my God, Charlie, look, it's so mathy. You see what they've done? They made it look so mathy with ends and subtraction and whatnot. Let's read this aloud together in English. Wah, 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 wah. That's what it says. That's what it says. The exponent, there it is, n, blah, 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 comes down and multiplies the thing. And then the exponent gets demoted by 1. That's what's happening. Charlie, that seems awful careless. But it's, it's, it's not dangerous at all. Believe me, I wouldn't be telling you to do that if it was a careless thing to do. That's the rule written explicitly. It's on your equation. So if you ever forget, you can go back and look at that. But you've got to translate math speak into something that you get, something that makes sense to you. There it is. It's called the power rule of differentiation, the power. Because it applies to anything of this form. Anything of this form. I mean, well, Shadi, you got to make sure you write it exactly that way. No, because there's another way that it's written. There's a different version of this equation sheet. There's a different version of this equation sheet that's written this way that the derivative with respect to x, which is how the language it used to say that, of a x to the n is equal to a times n x to the n minus 1. Oh, I don't recognize it. Why is there an a in there? Oh my gosh, things have changed. No. a is just some number that happens to be sitting there. The a is multiplying. Not only is it multiplying my monomial x to the n, but it's going to multiply whatever the answer is. So the A can just take a step back and let the derivative happen. Constants, this is the language that I'm going to use a lot. A constant can be taken out of the derivative because that constant multiplying factor is going to multiply the result as well as the function itself. So that A is sometimes put in, sometimes not put in. You'll see the equation written in different ways. You open a bunch of calculus textbooks, you'll see it different every time, but it all says the same thing. Wah, 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 wah. That's what it says, always. Now, now, I'm going to <clears throat> take just a moment here, pardon me, really quick, to take a selfie with my, no, I'm not going to take a selfie, I just need to photograph it. Is that all of it? Do I have all of it? No, I don't have all of it. Pardon me, I'm going to go into the cheap seats here a little bit. I'm going to take a picture of that because I love it so much. Now, Let's take it out for a spin, shall we? Like do something real. I need a polynomial that I could find the rate of change of. This nonsense that I did here was something that I just made up. It was something I just made up. Let me take something not made up. 
something that actually has physical meaning. There is a set of physical, physical conditions in our physics. And that is motion with constant acceleration, where we have read about and over uh, the summer months we've spent some time messing around with that the position as a function of time is equal to the initial position plus the initial velocity times time plus one half of the acceleration multiplied by the time squared. That is an equation of kinematics that is a favorite of young people everywhere. X is equal to X naught plus V zero T plus one half A T squared. By the way, those of you who've already gone through the honors physics program and are now on the other side of it, I'm feeling very grumpy this year, and so students in honors physics this year will be required to memorize equations as opposed to having them given on the test. I am sick to death. Because uh, I need you to think about relationships, and that, boy, that makes an awful lot of sense. That makes an awful lot of sense to me. But I would like to know if that is the position as a function of time, which is not always true, by the way. It is the position as a function of time only in the case where the acceleration is constant. It's the position as a function of time only in the case where the acceleration is constant. If that's true, then what would be the velocity as a function of time? Well, in order to work that out, I'm going to apply this new thing of calculus that I have. And I'm going to do it very brazenly. But before I do, I would not actually do this if I were solving this problem, but just to, for, your, uh, for your enlightenment to make it a little bit easier to see. I'm going to write this as x naught t to the 0. x naught t to the 0. So how do we do t to the 0? t to the 0 is just 1. Yeah, I'm putting it in there so that the rule applies. So that the rule applies. Plus uh, the initial velocity times time plus 1 half of the acceleration multiplied by t squared. And I'm going to apply this rule, but I'm going to apply it in a cowboy calculus kind of way. What's the rule? The exponent comes down and multiplies, and then the exponent gets demoted. Well, look what happens here. Oh, by the way, I guess I should write that what I'm looking for here is dx dt, the rate at which this function changes. I'm going to apply my new rule, the pattern that I discovered by doing a bunch of math on the side and then realizing the pattern. The exponent comes down and multiplies. The zero comes down, game over. The zero comes down and multiplies. It's gone. Everything's gone. Multiplication by zero is gone. So that term that appears in my equation becomes zero. Now, here's what I'm saying. Even I've got you mixed up in a rule now. Oh, I get it. The zero comes down and multiplies, and then that goes, and then that term disappears. We're out of our minds because I'm talking about the rate of change in time. This quantity is the initial position. It doesn't change in time. It's a constant. Of course, the rate at which it changes in time is zero. And now I've turned it into a math thing. Our obvious statement of the meaning converted into math. No good. Well, it's good for this discussion. But in actual physics, I should look at that and go, of course, the rate of change of that is zero. It's a constant. It doesn't change. You see, the meaning of the math, along with the math itself. Next one. This is t to the, I should have written up here. I'm going to now. This is t to the first. How did t to the first? t to the first is just t. You don't write that. Yeah, I'm writing it for the educational purposes here. So bring the exponent down. Bring that 1 down and multiply. Which doesn't do anything. All right. Doesn't do anything. Cool. I like that. Easy to do. Not complaining. Demote the exponent. T to the first minus one. One minus one is zero. T to the zero is one. This becomes, this becomes V zero. This becomes V zero. The way you start to think about this as you do more and more calculus in practical cases is that when you take the derivative of a constant times the variable, the variable just vanishes and you have a constant line. You'll start to get that, it'll just start to become habit. And it's not a dangerous habit to develop because it always happens. Because the rule is very simple. The rule is very simple. Last one the two comes down and multiplies. Two over two. Hey, that's one. It seems like just such a coincidence that the two comes down, but there's all the two there. So it's two over two is one. It seems like a coincidence, but it's not. It's not a coincidence at all. Demote the exponent. t squared becomes t. So this becomes plus a times t. Now, how is it that I'm going to interpret this change quantity? The rate of change of position is velocity. Did I do something wrong again? No, no. I had a really basic problem you were talking about. 
Do you see? Yeah, I see. Yay! Okay. <clears throat> Just run some wires off your solar powered calculator. <laughs> it's got power left over. This is the ah! oh, this is the rate of change of position. The rate of change of position is velocity. Oh, hello. I can't help but feel as though we've met somewhere before. B is equal to V0 plus AT. That's my next kinematic equation. Now, the first time I might have encountered that in an algebra-based physics course, it was like, let me write some algebra over here and define the velocity on average and jam that in and write some functions out and do some canceling and whatnot and come to the answer. And everybody in the room is like, oh my god, algebra, I hate you. But I got the V0, now I got the, my V0 plus AT because the rate of change. Oh, let's go crazy. Let's go crazy. Why not now find the acceleration, which is the rate of change of the velocity with respect to time? Now that I have the velocity as a function of time, let's go ahead and find the acceleration as a function of time. It should be quite simple. It should be quite simple because the derivative of the velocity with respect to time, I'm going to do this, uh, this procedure again with the power rule, but I'm going to do it without the crutch. That's b naught. It is a constant. It is the initial velocity. It does not change with respect to time. So the rate of change of the velocity with respect to time is womp zero. If you want, it's v naught t to the zero. Womp, 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 zero comes down, multiplies, it's all zero. If you want, drop the crutch, right? Realize what it is, right? Start doing things in a, in a sexy, powerful sort of way. That derivative of v naught is zero, is the thing that I would say, because it doesn't change with respect to time. The rate of change of v naught is zero. A t, however, this is a t to the first. One comes down, multiplies, demote the exponent t to the one minus one as t to the zero is one. The answer is a, which is a constant. So the funny thing that I write here now in the next step is that a is equal to a. Well, yeah. a is equal to a, yeah. OK. A is equal to a constant, which is the fundamental assumption of this set of equations that I use to solve problems. These equations only work when the acceleration is constant. But the calculus works anytime. Hanna, do you remember we had a quiz recently where the acceleration was not a constant, but it was 12 times t? Well, if the position as a function of time was cubic, see how this is a polynomial? It's got a squared term in it. If the position as a, of as a function of time were cubic, then the velocity as a function of time would be quadratic. Then the acceleration as a function of time would be linear. Now, as a young physics student, you look at that question where it says the acceleration is 12t, and you go, oh, crap, the acceleration is not constant. I look at it and go, ooh, the position's cubic. Has to be. Because the process of finding the rates of change demotes ex exponents. I love that. <laughs> because the exponents, my God, exponents are a pain in the ass. Exponents are what lead to foiling and having to use the quadratic formula and whatnot. Let's demote some exponents. Well, of course, you don't get to choose when it's appropriate to take a rate of change. Um, and when it's not appropriate.